My name is Annie. I am one of the pastors, and it is a delight to be with you this morning. We bounce around from service to service, and so it's always a delight to come and worship with y'all in traditional. This is our last installment of Thinking Through It, the sermon series where we seek to become a people of constant prayer and gratitude. Not only is gratitude proven to calm our spirit, to ease anxiety, and to increase contentment, but it is a natural gift of the spirit grown in faith. Gratitude in all circumstances is a sign of Christian perfection. So don't worry if you haven't gotten there quite yet. You're on the way. You're on the way. So am I. It is a sign of growth in sanctifying grace, a way of being that permeates our every action, our every word, our every breath, because we know who is the giver of good things, who is the giver of life, and who is worthy to be praised. We are a people of gratitude because we are the people of God who is good, and there is no other way to be in the face of perfect grace and goodness but to be overcome with thankfulness, which is why we're hanging on to Thanksgiving for one more Sunday. <laughs> As we hear the scriptures spoken and the word preached, I invite you to pray with me. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the words of Scripture are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our two main passages from this morning come from the book of Jonah, chapter 2, and Ephesians, chapter 2. There are no slides today, so you can open up a Bible if you have one or if there's one in your pew, or you can just listen along. From Jonah. From, the inside, from inside of the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple." The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath barred in me forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. And from Ephesians, this is from chapter 2, and I'm using uh, NIV. This is all of chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, Happy New Year's Eve, church church new year that is i heard a few chuckles some of you get it we have made it to the last sunday of the liturgical year 
We don't always mark it like that, but this is the last Sunday of the liturgical year. It's often celebrated as Christ the King or Reign of Christ Sunday, marking the end of ordinary time. So all these green banners and stoles, the end of ordinary time and ushering in Advent at once, both a penitent and a joyous season of expectation and hope. You'll see blue and purple come around this church at the time of Advent just next week and we're preparing to decorate for Christmas. All of this is happening right now because this is the end of the liturgical year. Christ the King is a relatively new feast in the Christian year. Born in the 1920s out of political and social strife, it's become a chance for us as a church to proclaim Christ as our King, to proclaim our ultimate allegiance to Christ over every nation, over everything, over every ideology, to remember who we are as followers of Jesus and who Jesus Christ is as the triumph of creation, as our savior in whom we put our ultimate hope. It is a reminder not to put our hope in things of this world, which we are often tempted to do. This is a good day to remember our salvation, to remember our baptism, our testimonies of conversion at the table or in fellowship, our life with God. To remember what God has done in our own lives personally, but also in the life of the church and the life of the world. That's one reason I like to say Happy New Year's or Happy New Year's Eve. This is a chance to reflect on what God has done and who God is. It's one reason that I was so happy that I get to be in traditional today. We say the Apostles' Creed today. We confess in that creed our allegiance to Christ. We lay down idolatries, be they political or deeply personal, things that keep us from keeping Jesus front and center in our lives, things that prevent us from enjoying the love of God and heeding the call of the Spirit to reflect that love to the world. Our Old Testament text today puts our idolatries and God's saving mercies front and center. You may remember from vacation Bible school or Sunday school the story of Jonah and the whale or Jonah and the big fish. And maybe you even have some songs in your head or some pictures of a big blue sea monster and Jonah being spit out onto a beach at the end of those three days. But this is not your typical prophet story. Nor is it your typical book of prophecies. There are no poetic oracles from God or polemics pleading a people to change before they're destroyed or they destroy themselves. No, this is a true narrative. This is a story, and it's about Jonah. It's about Jonah, who honestly is a terrible prophet. It's a story about a parody of a prophet. Jonah is no hero. Scholars remind us that the behavior of the prophet is clearly and unusually disobedient. The stories about prophets don't normally start out with the prophet hearing the call and completely running the other way, but that's exactly what Jonah does. He receives a clear call from the Lord to break boundaries of language and culture and religion and to witness boldly with a message of repentance and forgiveness to the people of Nineveh. And yet, instead of showing up, to the task at hand, he runs in the opposite direction from Nineveh. He hops aboard a ship and he leaves home. In fact, Jonah's flight is twice characterized in the book as fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Jonah's trying to literally run from God. Jonah boards a ship at Joppa bound for Tarshish, likely on the coast of Spain. Again, other direction. No, Jonah's not a good prophet. He denies basic truths about God, not out of like a humble, reasonable doubt, like asking good questions, not out of reasonable objection, objections. No, he outright rejects God because it's inconvenient for him to accept God. He rejects God. He rejects the characteristics of God out of his own idolatries. At first, we can only imagine what's going on in Jonah's head, but it becomes really clear later in the story when we hear some of his own dialogue with God. But at the beginning, we have to wonder, what's going on? Maybe he's prejudiced against the Ninevites. Maybe he doesn't want to go to their land and to their people. He sees them as less than or as unworthy. Maybe he is afraid of what could happen if he does go to this strange land, if he does go and represent God and speaks an unwelcome truth about sin and a need for God's mercy. And maybe he just lacks courage. 
Maybe he's embarrassed that he lacks courage, and so he runs away from the situation. Perhaps he's just stubborn, and this is what I'm thinking, because when he runs and he climbs aboard that ship, he falls into a deep sleep. It's like he wants to be completely unaffected by life, to literally stay asleep to God and asleep to the world and asleep to himself and the calling that God gave him, safe in the hull of the ship that he escaped on. Out of all of these idolatries, he rejects God. He rejects God's omnipresence, literally thinking that he could run away from God by just going in the other direction. God's not over there. God's over here. I'm going to go that way. (laughs) He just thinks he can avoid it. He rejects God's authority by blatantly disobeying the clear calling he received. He heard a clear direction. I don't know how many of us get clear directions from God, but when you do, listen to it. (laughs) He hears it. He knows what he's supposed to do, and he does the other thing, the opposite thing. But perhaps most egregiously, at least for me, and this is what's most sad in the book of Jonah, at the end of the story, he rejects God's love, God's mercy and compassion. Not for himself, though, for other people. The people Jonah was sent to, to urge repentance and to preach salvation, to tell the people that God wants their hearts whole and healed and God is greatly disappointed by the sin and evil and the destruction of the city. When Jonah is given the gift of salvation, like physically from the belly of the fish and spiritually given a second chance, he gives thanks to God for himself. Thank you, God, for saving me. But when the people actually change their hearts, he rejects salvation for the people he evidently hates. You see, the people of Nineveh do hear his voice. Jonah must have been a good preacher, and the people must have been ready to receive the good news and do something about it, because they actually changed their ways. And it kind of happened overnight. It was fast, and it was effective. By all means, in this wild story, Jonah's the most successful of all the prophets, and he gets what most prophets want for there to actually be change evident in people's lives, for the world to get better instead of worse, for there to be more healing instead of brokenness, he gets what most prophets want. Most prophets want repentance and healing and all the good salvation stuff that comes with it, all the good works. But Jonah just doesn't. He just doesn't want it for the people that he doesn't like. God has just spared Nineveh from the destruction he threatened, just as God saved Jonah from himself and from the sea. God, in loving kindness, has mercy on Nineveh. And this is what chapter 4 has to say. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, this being having mercy on Nineveh. This seemed very wrong, and he became angry. Verse 2 through 3 says, He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. He is so bitter and so angry at the people that he hates. His own hatred for this people has been revealed. His own stubborn pride has been revealed. His own idolatry has been exposed, and he would rather die than see God's salvation for another. This is not true gratitude. This is greed. Churches that are preaching from the lectionary today, a a lectionary is the calendar of scripture readings that follows the liturgical year and provides a survey of scripture. These churches have today a reading for Christ the King Sunday from Matthew. I don't know how often Matthew and Jonah are preached together, but roll with it. This is what Matthew says in chapter 25, verses 31 through 40, and they'll be familiar to you likely. When the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he'll separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry. And you gave me something to eat. 
I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in, needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. You can read the rest of that chapter to see what he says to those who say, Lord, Lord, but did not heed the plea of the hungry and the sick and the thirsty and the naked and the imprisoned. It's not good. I wonder if Jonah would have truly changed his heart had he heard and heeded this warning from Jesus. While inside the big fish, Jonah really does pour out his heart to God through a prayer where he does blame God for the bad things that have happened to him, and that's a whole other sermon, but he ultimately correctly praises God for mercy, for the mercy that God has shown him despite his bad behavior, saying earnestly, salvation belongs to the Lord. Don't get me wrong, this is a beautiful, a beautiful part of scripture, and it should be our prayer too. Salvation belongs to the Lord. I at least hope that Jonah was earnest, that Jonah was speaking from a true heart of faith when he said these words. He knows he has been saved from himself, right? He's the one who ran away when he knew exactly what he was supposed to be doing. He's the one who boarded a ship and took along with that all the risks of being on a ship in the middle of a storm. He knew what he was doing. And he was saved from himself and from the sea. And an example of being thankful through good and bad times, Jonah's God-given ability to be truly grateful and to recognize God even when things do not seem like they could get any lower is made clear. God's salvation, both our spiritual salvation and the moments where we're even miraculously rescued physically despite whatever we might deserve, definitely deserves praise. Of course, that deserves praise. When Jonah prays and praises in the whale, he makes a vow based on the hope of God's salvation. He's going to give God praise, which is right, because God's gift of salvation is a good gift of free grace. Obviously, Jonah did nothing to deserve help and a second chance. But as Paul says in Ephesians, this salvation is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And what is the response? What is the right response to a good gift but gratitude? Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives good gifts. But our words of gratitude are empty if not fulfilled in our actions. This is why I don't really trust Jonah. I don't trust Jonah. Because later, his words of gratitude for salvation are not echoed in his actions to the very people God has called him to serve. Yes, salvation is a gift from God, and those of us who proclaim, Lord, Lord, that is to say, Jesus Christ, you are the king. Our allegiance belongs to you. My allegiance belongs to you. Have duties owed to the king. You and I are people of a good king, and we have duties owed to this good king. The French have a helpful phrase, much like our, with great power comes great responsibility. Noblesse oblige. The dictionary definition is this, the obligation of honorable, generous, and responsible behavior associated with high rank or birth. Essentially, if you're privileged, that is, if you're gifted with good things, you didn't earn them, right? You're just gifted with them. This is just how the dice were rolled. You are obligated, duty bound by honor to be obedient to this responsibility to have integrity and to be good stewards of your status and wealth to bless others. Noblesse oblige. Our gratitude for being saved from the belly of the whale, if it is true thankfulness, a gift from the spirit, a product of faithful prayer, should result in obedience to the king. Our king is exalted in heaven, yes, and we can rightly think of thrones and banners, angels and trumpets and bells, 
But our king also chose a simple life on earth. Our infant king's first throne was a wooden box filled with straw that was scratchy. His gardens were not private courtyards, but wild caves and hills where he knelt in prayer. His table was not full of guests dressed to the nines, lounging and binging on the finest breads and wines. His table was in a simple upper room where he ate with beloved friends and forgotten outsiders and sinners. His anointing was not by a priest in a grand and gilded throne room, but precious oil poured from a woman's single sacrifice of fine perfume for burial. His last earthly throne was, a high, was high and lifted up, but it was a wooden cross on which he bore and took away the sins of the world. Like Jonah speaking to the Ninevites, Matthew has a warning from God to us, to you and me. The king will judge the sheep and the goats, some to blessing and others to destruction. On the one hand, Christ has offered himself up as the only goat, as the sacrifice for our sins, for all of the times when we've coveted God's good gifts for ourselves, when we did not feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, clothe the naked, or visit the imprisoned, when we hated another, when we wanted to keep good gifts, salvation for ourselves that salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord has seen fit to offer salvation to us, to sinners who reject God, sinners who run away from God, who give back only idolatries, anger and pride and self-righteousness in the face of mercy, which ought to spark thankfulness. Salvation is a free gift, a gift we don't deserve, a gift we can only be grateful for. As Paul says in Ephesians, we were by nature deserving wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Grace, unmerited favor, grace. At the same time, our king has saved us not just from ourselves or from the natural and eternal consequences of sin and death, but to something to a vocation, a calling, a duty. Paul goes on, and God raised up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in kindness to us in Christ. For it is by grace you've been saved, not through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. True gratitude for salvation will move us, not just to song and prayer, which is good and worthy, but also to caring for the poor, the forgotten, and the despised. We are not just saved from sin and death. We are saved to goodness in life, goodness in life that will reflect in beautiful prayers and praises to God and will reflect in actions, in actions of mercy and justice. We're not going to be like Jonah. We're going to vow to praise the Lord with our words and our deeds. For this is what we were created in Christ to do. That verse from Ephesians might sound familiar to you because we just finished our our series on the 40th anniversary, on how we are here for good, on how we are here for good. We're here for good works in Christ Jesus. It is Christ the King Sunday, the end of a church year and the beginning of a new one. I want to take a moment and invite you to take a moment to reflect on the church year that has passed, to reflect on the story of salvation in the church year. First, in Advent, we anticipated Christ's coming, both as the promised Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us, and the promised return when he will bring the new heavens and the new earth, and all will be made well. We heard God's voice pronounce Jesus' blessing and calling as prophet, priest, and king at his baptism by John at the River Jordan. During Lent, we fasted and we prayed with him in the desert and saw him tempted to take the easy, idolatrous way out of hardship. 
We heard Jesus reject that temptation and obediently heed God's call to sacrificial love and then saw the results of that love during Holy Week as he walked the way of sorrows through suffering to death on a cross, taking away the sins of the world. We rejoiced with an incredible Easter as morning dawned with the risen sun and a promise of life with him now and an eternity in the light of God's face made within reach by grace. At his ascension, we heard his commissioning to go into all the world to make disciples for the transformation of the world. We saw him rising to his proper place, to his enthronement in the very presence of God the Father. At Pentecost, when we had these red and orange and yellow banners all throughout the sanctuary. We felt the gift of his spirit blow through us like a wind, like fire, as we sought to be the church at work in the world. And now, at the close of the year, we bow before the one who loved us and loves us, the king of the universe, who claimed us and redeemed us. We sing praise and thanksgiving for that blessing and that hope, and pray that it might rightly move us to do good works, to bless the world in the name of our king, Jesus Christ. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks and praise to our God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. You've already heard the beginning of an invitation to discipleship. The story of the Christian year is our story. It is the story of salvation made alive and anew in each one of our lives and in the lives of of us as a church. We are invited year after year to come together to make our way spiraling at once deeper into the bottomless heart of God's mercy and higher into God's glorious goodness. If you're moved today to start a relationship with this good king, this king who chooses a cross for a throne and asks his people to give gifts and gratitude to the poor, to the lonely, to the forgotten, If you want to meet and know and to share Jesus, this Savior, we invite you to come forward for prayer and to start the conversation. I or Pastor Michelle or any of the other pastors, anyone here, would love to start walking this journey with you, to start walking this journey with you deeper into the heart of God and higher into God's goodness. It's a journey we're all on together. None of us are done with it yet. And it is worthwhile, not just because of the promise of heaven and new creation, but because giving Jesus our allegiance here and now changes everything. Only because of our good king can we give thanks in all circumstances. That is a supernatural power. As we sing and prepare for our benediction, if you're moved to come forward and commit your life to Christ the king for the first time or for the hundredth time, but in a new way, Finish off the liturgical year right. Come and be blessed and receive prayer. 